When two navies bother to fly the same uncrewed helicopter in the same airspace from the same coastline with their operators standing shoulder to shoulder, they are not doing it for a photo opportunity. They are rehearsing a future where the eyes of a fleet are no longer tied to the availability, fatigue limits and cost profile of manned aviation. And that is exactly what the Royal Navy and the French Navy signaled with their January 2026 drone training at Hieres on France's Mediterranean coast. This is not a niche experiment anymore. It's doctrine catching up with technology. Start with the setting, because Hieres matters. Base Aeronautique Naval de Hieres is the French Navy's only Mediterranean air station co-located with a civilian airport, but also plugged into France's naval aviation ecosystem and specialist units. That combination is quietly valuable. It means a mature support environment, tight airspace management, and a realistic operating context where laboratory conditions are harder to fake. If you want to standardize procedures, validate safety cases, and stress test operator workflows, you do it somewhere that forces you to behave like you would on deployment, not like you're running a controlled demo. Into this environment, the Royal Navy sent personnel from 700 Naval Air Squadron with Peregrine, its shipborne uncrewed rotary wing aircraft. Peregrine is the Royal Navy's frontline adapted variant of the Shebel S-100 camcopter, a civilian origin design that has been militarized with additional equipment. That sentence alone carries a bigger message. Navies are increasingly comfortable taking a proven commercial platform and integrating it into military maritime operations, rather than waiting for a bespoke gold-plated program to mature over a decade. It's a very 2020s approach to capability, iterate, integrate, deploy, learn, then iterate again. Now consider the partner on the French side. This was not just a meet and greet with another squadron that happens to fly drones. The Royal Navy trained alongside Marine National personnel in the Centre d'Experimentations Pratiques de l'Aeronautique Navale, France's experimental test and evaluation squadron responsible for assessing new aviation systems and technologies. That detail is revealing. Test and evaluation units don't show up unless there's a serious interest in how something is operated, how it's sustained, what the failure modes look like, and how the concepts of operation can be refined. In other words, this wasn't only about can we fly it, but how do we institutionalize it? The core capability being traded here is operational experience with uncrewed rotary wing aircraft. Fixed wing drones dominate headlines, but at sea, rotary wing UAVs solve a very specific problem. How to put a sensor over the horizon from a ship that might not have the deck space, hangar capacity, or crew to run manned helicopters around the clock. Peregrine is described as capable of sorties lasting up to five hours and, crucially, operating beyond the visual horizon of its host ship or base. That beyond visual horizon phrasing is not marketing fluff. It is the difference between a drone that is a fancy camera hovering near the ship and a drone that extends the ship's situational awareness out into the battle space where decisions are actually made. And what decisions are those? In the real world, many maritime missions are less about dramatic fleet battles and more about persistent surveillance, identification and response, maritime security, monitoring contacts of interest, verifying behavior, and maintaining a picture that doesn't collapse the moment the weather changes or the crew gets stretched. The Royal Navy explicitly points to operational use in the Gulf, where the drone supported maritime security tasks by providing persistent surveillance of contacts of interest. That's an important clue about what Peregrine is actually good at today, not what it might be good at someday. It's an ISR enabler, a time on station multiplier, and a workload reducer. This is where the economics become strategic. The Royal Navy notes that this drone employment has reduced demands on crewed helicopters while lowering fuel use and operational costs. That is not just a budget talking point. It is a manpower and readiness argument because every hour you don't fly a manned helicopter for routine surveillance is an hour you preserve for tasks that genuinely require a crewed aircraft complex intercepts, search and rescue, certain types of boarding support, or missions where onboard decision-making in the aircraft is essential. In an era where fleets are under pressure to do more with finite crews and maintenance pipelines, a system that trims the routine without sacrificing coverage is a force multiplier in the most literal sense. So why train together and why now? Because the French Navy also operates the S-100 system, primarily from its Mistral-class helicopter assault ships, and both navies employ the platform in broadly similar surveillance roles. Interoperability isn't just a NATO slogan, it's a set of very specific habits. How do you launch and recover in different sea states? How do you handle airspace deconfliction near a busy coastline? What does the handover look like between ship control, mission control, and any shore-based support elements? How do you manage link reliability, mission planning, and maintenance rhythms when the ship's schedule is compressing and the operational picture is changing? 
These are the kinds of procedural details that determine whether a capability is dependable or merely available. And there's a deeper reason common platforms create common language. If both navies fly the same basic air vehicle, they can compare everything from checklists to training syllabi, from safety margins to how they interpret weather limitations. The Royal Navy describes the exchange as sharing operating practices. That sounds modest, but it's how you accelerate learning without waiting for accidents or failures to teach you. In peacetime training, you trade mistakes so you don't have to repeat them under pressure. Notice also how this training simultaneously served a readiness function for the Royal Navy team. Favorable weather conditions at Jerez enabled personnel to renew their drone operator qualifications. This matters because uncrewed aviation still lives and dies by human proficiency. The drone may be uncrewed, but the operation is not unmanned. Operator currency, procedural discipline, and a deep feel for system behavior are what turn an uncrewed aircraft into a reliable extension of the ship. If you lose that currency, your force multiplier becomes a hangar queen. Now, zoom out and ask the uncomfortable question, what is the strategic implication of making shipborne drones routine? The obvious answer is expanded maritime domain awareness. But the more interesting answer is decision tempo. When a ship can push a sensor over the horizon for hours at a time, it compresses the time between detection and classification and it reduces uncertainty. And in naval operations, uncertainty is often the most expensive commodity. How many times does a task group burn precious manned flight hours just to figure out whether a contact is worth attention? How many times do commanders make conservative choices because the picture is incomplete? A five-hour uncrewed sortie doesn't just collect imagery, it stabilizes the operational narrative. This also hints at a future where amphibious and surface ships carry layered aviation, manned helicopters for heavy tasks, and uncrewed rotorcraft for persistent sensing. On French Mistral-class ships, that pairing is particularly logical because an amphibious assault ship is by nature a platform that needs continuous awareness of its surrounding sea and air approaches while managing complex deck operations. For the Royal Navy, integrating Peregrine into frontline operations similarly suggests a drive to make smaller teams more effective, especially when deployed far from fixed support. But there's a final piece that deserves attention. Training with an experimental test and evaluation squadron is a sign that both navies are still shaping what good looks like. The technology is here, but the mature concept of operations is still being refined. How do you integrate drone feeds into the combat system workflow so the right people see the right data at the right time? How do you prevent information overload while still exploiting persistent surveillance? How do you build trust in an uncrewed system so that commanders actually plan around it rather than treating it as a nice to have? Those are not engineering problems, they're organizational problems, and organizational problems are solved through repeated shared practice, exactly the kind of joint training we're looking at here. So if you're watching this story and thinking it's just another exercise note, ask yourself, why would two professional navies invest time in aligning procedures for a capability that supposedly sits on the margins? They wouldn't. This is the quiet normalization of shipborne uncrewed aviation moving from novelty to necessity. The Mediterranean training at Hyares with Peregrine and the shared S-100 experience is less about what happened on those flight lines and more about what it implies for the next deployment cycle. More persistence, lower cost per hour of surveillance, reduced strain on manned helicopters, and a steadily growing web of interoperable maritime ISR across allied fleets. And the question that follows is simple, but it should bother every naval planner. If uncrewed rotary wing aircraft can already stay up for hours, operate beyond the horizon and meaningfully reduce the burden on crewed aviation in real operational theaters like the Gulf, then how quickly does optional become expected? Because once commanders get used to seeing farther sooner and for longer, they don't willingly go back.